Hi, everybody. My name is Sandy Boucher once again, and we are here with the next step in the 52 Steps to Reconciliation. Once again, in this section of videos, we are looking at what life is like on the indigenous side of the feather. Last week, I talked about the hum, and thank you very much for the emails I received. That one always gets a response. But this time, I want to talk about another heavy, heavy topic. But I might give you a different perspective on it. And what I'm talking about is the residential school era. Now, if my mom was here, she would be upset right now because I used the phrase residential school era. You see, my mom didn't like any phrase that took something huge and turned it into three little words. Because in my mind and in my mom's mind, that made it too easy for people to minimize what you were talking about. If you can use an acronym, it takes something huge and reduces it down to something convenient. And as I've often said, reconciliation is anything but convenient. So we know about the residential schools. We know the kids were taken, but I wanna add some information in that maybe you haven't considered. So first off, let's look at this cute little, little cartoon. This little guy, imagine that he's three or four years old. My elder, the woman that I go to for guidance, was four when she was first taken to the schools. Her husband was three, so the age is very relevant. Now this little guy, I want you to imagine that he belongs to the first generation that was sent to the schools which means before this happened, he would have been at home with his parents and his grandparents, his aunts and uncles and siblings and community members. He would have been surrounded by love and encouragement like any child that age is. But suddenly he was taken to the schools and everything changed. If I were to ask you what happens to a child three, four, five, six years old, if they're constantly told that they're stupid, that they're unwanted, that they're a burden to the people that have to look after them, that they're never going to amount to anything. What happens to that child? You know the answer as well as I do. You start believing it. And that's the kind of things that happen to our children, even if the abuses didn't. This cute little guy is going to stay in the school until he reaches the age of 18. Yes, he gets to come home for a week at Christmas and maybe a couple of weeks during the summer. But for the most part, this is his experience. Now he's a young adult and he's graduated from the residential schools and life goes on and eventually he becomes a parent of his own little munchkin. Now as a dad, I always like to think that, and I like to believe that if he's rested, he's in a good mood, he's fed, that maybe when he talks to his son, he sounds like his parents or his grandparents that he can remember that love and care that he still received at home. But there's also a really good chance that if he's tired or frustrated or hungry, that he could actually sound like the people from the schools when he talks to his own child. One of the things that we don't highlight often enough is the fact that for residential school survivors, not only did they go to the schools themselves, but depending on how old you were, you had to watch your own child be taken to the very same school to endure what you've been through. Now, I've said to many audiences over the years that if I had to go through that, if I had to watch someone take my children, I would have chose to drown myself in alcohol, not because I have an addiction problem, but because I'm trying not to think about what's happening to my children. 
So now time goes on and that little munchkin grows up and has their own child. And that munchkin grows up and has their own child. And again and again and again. What most people don't realize is that depending on the area you lived in and who your family was, between five and seven generations of our families survived the residential school era. That's how long it's been since we had healthy examples of loving parents. How do you learn to be a parent? You have one. You decide what you're going to replicate. You decide what you want to do differently, but you have the example. And for seven years or seven generations, we didn't. Yet nowadays, our parents are being judged. Our children are being taken because we don't know how to parent them. Whose, pro whose fault would that be? We need to replace those skills. We need to put that parenting knowledge back into our community. And I don't believe that's resolved by taking our children. There's one thing you may not realize. There are more indigenous children in care today than there was at any point during the residential school era. For reconciliation to happen, that has to change. Until next week, my friend, take care. Bye-bye.